sure um, you read stories in the Bible and you read about men and women who lived really amazing lives or went through really amazing experiences and you think, I can never do what he or she did. I just, my faith isn't that strong. Or I just, I wouldn't have been able to deal with it the same way that they did. <clears throat> but I think if you take some time and you just meditate on the scriptures and meditate on those stories, you realize that when you look at those situations, there's a lot of things that we can take today and apply them to our own lives and be as effective for God as those men and women are in, in God's word. And so today I want to read in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and look at the man Jehoshaphat and some one experience that he went through and take a few lessons from how he dealt with that situation. So 2 Chronicles chapter 20, starting at verse 1. Now it came about that after this, that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Mennonites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of Aram and beyond. They are in Hezron, Tamar, that is, Endige. Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, you are not God in the heavens, and are you not ruler over the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, out, did you not o our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? They have lived in it, and they have built you a sanctuary there for your name, saying, Should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. Now behold, the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade, when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given to us as an inheritance. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jezeel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeril, the son of Mataniah, the Levite of the sons of Aspha. And he said, Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the king, of Je king Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Aziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of, it, of Jeril. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves, stand, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out and face them, for the Lord is with you. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. The Levites from the sons of Kohathites, the sons of Korathites, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with every loud voice. They rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Ju Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And they began singing and praising the Lord, set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so they were routed. 
For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. When Judah came out to look out of the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude. And behold, there were corpses lying on the ground, and no one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came <coughs> excuse me, to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods and garments and valuable things, which they took for themselves, more than they could carry. And they were three days taking the spoil, because there was so much. Then on the fourth day they assembled in the valley of Baraka, for they had blessed the Lord. Therefore they have named the place the Valley of Barak until today. Every man of Judah and Jerusalem returned with Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy for the Lord, and made them to rejoice over their enemies. They came to Jerusalem with harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord, and the dread of God was on all the kings, sorry, on all the kingdoms of the lands, when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God gave him rest on all sides. Now Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 25 years. And I apologize for the long reading, but I was trying to figure out what to leave out, and I didn't want to leave out anything. So just truly an amazing story of how God looked after his people. And you look at Jehoshaphat, and I just want to take a few lessons that I took out of it. And the very first one was that Jehoshaphat put himself in a position to seek God. He was ready when the call was given to him. And something that I've enjoyed doing over the years as relaxation is reading biographies about various people. And one that I read about a year or two ago was about a man named Jeff Bezos, uh, who some of you might know, him? who started Amazon. But the other thing about Jeff Bezos is that he was, his company was everything to him. And everything he did in his life was to make sure that everything went well. And the amazing thing is that it was important to him that he said, each day I need to put myself in a position to make three important decisions. That's it. Three important decisions. And everything he did in the day was geared towards making those three important decisions. When he went to bed, when he woke up, when he had those meetings, it was all focused on making sure that those three meetings went well. Jehoshaphat was told that this army was coming, and the first thing he did was seek the Lord. And my, my message to you today about that is that seeking the Lord is not a switch that you can turn on and off when you need to. You need to be ready. And what do we do day in and day out as far as preparing ourselves when trials come in our lives? Are we ready to seek the Lord wholeheartedly when those trials come? Because I guarantee you there's not a single person in this room that won't have at least one trial in their life, and they're going to need to seek the Lord. Who do I spend time with day in and day out? Who is the influencers in my life that I look to for guidance? What does my day look like? Do I center my life around serving the Lord and seeking Him? It's just as important to make sure that we stay away from those that can have negative impacts on the decisions we make. And you look at the example of the Lord, and He was absolutely perfect in every way, and there are times that we read in the Word when He was with people, and He just left. He quietly exited, because He realized that there was no good being in that particular situation. There was nothing He could do to glorify His Father, and He quietly left. We need to make sure that we put ourselves in a position to seek the Lord. Verse 9 says, Should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. Jehoshaphat had this attitude that he was going to stand by his God no matter what. No matter how difficult the situation was, he was not going to leave his God. I was very fortunate growing up that I got to know all four of my grandparents very well. 
and I had a particular strong relationship with one of my grandparents. We called him Big G, uh, Grandpa George. And he wasn't just my grandfather, but uh, he was my friend. And I, I really loved him a lot. And um, he was a heavy smoker, and we always said to him that smoking was going to kill him. <laughs> and it did. And that's because he was in bed, he was reaching for a cigarette, he fell out of bed reaching for the cigarette and broke his hip. And so most of you know that when you're that old and you're in hospital and you have a broken hip, hmm. your days are numbered. Hmm. So Lisa and I went to go visit him, and the man that I saw in that hospital bed was now my big G. Oh. And it was very, very emotional for me. And we left the hospital and I said to Lisa, I'm never going back there again. And when I look back at a younger Rodney, I'm mad at myself that that was my attitude. And I realized that love should be a lot stronger than that, because it wasn't about me, it was about him. Hmm. And Jehoshaphat is being told that all these men are coming towards him. And they're not coming to give him good wishes and to say hello, they're coming to kill him hmm. and destroy him. And Jehoshaphat's response is, I am not leaving. And that was his message to his people. I am not leaving. He was going to stand by his God no matter what. We think about the Lord Jesus. And as Calvary is getting closer and closer and closer, those people that were surrounding him became less and less and less. <laughs> Until those final hours where it was just him all alone. Even his father left him. But the Lord did not stop loving us. And he fulfilled what he was supposed to on that cross. And he stood by his Father's will right till the very end. No matter how difficult things are going to get in our lives, we need to make sure that we stand by our God. Verse 15 says, Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord, Do not fear dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. It's very easy for us to say, well, that's very easy to listen to. You don't need to worry. God's going to look after it. But you think about what the message was. It took a lot of faith to have complete trust that God was going to look after everything for them. When I was first starting in my career, what happens is you're just given someone to help you out as an assistant. You don't get to choose the kind of person that works with you. And the kind of person that I got was not that reliable. <laughs> they were actually quite useless. And so I would give that person something to do. And what I would do is I would journal in my calendar the next day to actually look to make sure that it was done. So I had this cycle of saying, okay, please do this. Next day, I would check if it was done. And if it was not done, I'd ask them to do it again for, for the next day. And it was just this cycle. But eventually I got to a point where I had someone that actually knew what they were doing. <laughs> but it took me a long, long time to have complete trust that I could give something to them and not worry about it and just leave it with them. When we go through difficult times in our life, do we completely leave them with God? Or do we like to hold on to them a bit ourselves? Sometimes I know for myself, I say that I'm going to leave it with God and know that he's absolutely perfect in every way, and his plans are absolutely perfect. But I don't fully let go. I like to have a bit of a, a hand on the wheel, so to speak. Mm. That's not what God wants. God wants us to experience what Jehoshaphat and his people experienced in that day. The battle was God's, and he, they did not need to do a single thing, and did not need to worry. And you think about the Lord Jesus... And this morning we took the bread and the wine and remember what he did on Calvary. And he said on the cross, or sorry, when he was thinking about the cross, he said, not my will, but yours be done. He was putting everything aside and he realized that he needed to follow God's will. He knew exactly what it was going to be like on that cross to suffer at the hands of man and to suffer at the hands of his father. He knew what that pain was going to feel like. And he was able to say to his father, Not my will, but yours be done. We need to completely rely on God, no matter how difficult things get. 
verse 18 says, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. The word worship means to show reverence and adoration and honor. Reverence, adoration, and honor. Do we worship our God? How do we worship our God? A number of years ago, we had someone in our office retire, and he had been with the firm for 65 years. Wow. 65. He was almost 90 when he retired. <laughs> wow. And the management was trying to figure out how do you show someone like that who spent their whole career in one place and their commitment, how do you show someone respect to say thank you for all that you've done? And what they did, his name was Julian Hutchinson, and they actually put, they've got a room, a boardroom in our office called the Hutchinson Room. <laughs> and to me, I thought it was a very touching moment. It wasn't a pen or a plaque or anything like that that he takes home, but it's this reminder for us to see what that man did all those years ago. To me, it was amazing that not only did King Jehoshaphat bow down and worship, but all the people did. They were united together, adoring their God for what he had done. Sometimes I do not worship God the way that he is so deserving of. It's a very short-term thing, and I'm just, I know it's something I should do, and it's kind of checkmark, I've done that. And that's not what God wants. When people look at me, do they see that I'm a person that worships the God in heaven? Do they see it by my actions and by my words? If you read in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19, we read about those ten lepers. And the Lord tells them what to do and how to be cured of their leprosy. And you have to remember back then, leprosy was a very terrible disease to have. It meant that your life was not worth living for in many ways. And so he sends the ten lepers off. And how many come back to say thank you for the Lord? Just one. And you wonder how the Lord must have felt that only one of the ten came back to say thank you for what he had done for them. Does the Lord feel appreciated for my worship? Does he feel adoration does he feel reverence and honor for my worship? Verse 27 says, Every man of Judah and Jerusalem returned with Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them to rejoice over the enemies. They came to Jerusalem with harps, lyres, and trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the dread of God was on all the kingdoms of the lands when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God gave him rest on all sides. Are we joyful in the Lord? Do we experience joy like King Jehoshaphat and his people experience? I don't know about you, but the joy that I experience for many things, it's very short term. And you can think about times where you've experienced tremendous joy in your life. And how long do they last for? I remember when Lisa was pregnant with uh, Evan and Emily, and because it was twins, we got to, to go for an ultrasound, I think it was once a month, and they wanted to make sure that everything was going okay. And I remember one time, they were uh, measuring the abdomen of, of the babies, and so it came back that Evan had a very small abdomen, and so that's what we were told. And so me being me, thought, well, I'll look on Google to see what that means, because they always know the answer. <laughs> and you look at what a small abdomen means, and it's a list and list and list of all these terrible possible things that, that it could be. Well, down the road, we found out that it's just that Evan has a big head. <laughs> His head versus abdomen, and everything was obviously fine. <laughs> but that joy that I had when I found that Evan was going to be just fine didn't last very long. Oh. <laughs> and I think you know what I'm saying is that these joys that we experience that we, when, we, when we're worried and then we have the joy when we realize that things are going to be okay, those are very short-term things. When you read about Jehoshaphat and the joy that they had after this battle, it seems to me that it was very long-lasting. 
and they came back and they were singing and they were dancing, but it says they had peace the rest of Jehoshaphat's life. And I don't think that Jehoshaphat forgot what God did for him that day for the rest of his life. Do we take time every single day in the peace and the joy of the Lord that we have? Think about what we have to look forward to in heaven for eternity. Sometimes I think about eternity and I just can't get my head around it because it's just, it's so different. And the idea of experiencing that joy forever and ever. And you think about the Lord Jesus on the cross. And sometimes I know from past experience that we're going through such difficult times. It's so difficult to experience the joy of the Lord when you're going through those difficult times. But you think about the Lord Jesus and he's nailed upon the cross and the suffering and the pain and he sees someone beside him and he takes the time to say to that man, you will be in paradise with me. He uses the word paradise. He's all alone and he's suffering and he says to that man, you'll be in paradise. If the Lord can go through all that and still think about paradise and having that man be with him one day, there is nothing in this world that we go through that we can't still experience the joy of the Lord. Finally, in verse 32, it says, He walked in the way of his father Asa and did not depart from it, doing right in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from it, doing right in the sight of the Lord. We need to stay faithful in the Lord. We need to stay faithful in the Lord. I really enjoy watching movies that are based on true stories. And um, one movie that I've enjoyed a lot is a movie called Secretariat. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite surprised that I like it because I actually hate horses. But it's about a woman who loses her mother. And so she goes back to be with her father. And it's on this beautiful farm. And her father grew up racing horses and so on. And to make a long story short, what happens is that her father ends up passing away and she decides to look after this farm. And there's this one particular horse that she gets her hands on and raises it. And she gets a lot of pushback. And what's amazing about this woman is she's not doing it for the money or the fame or the recognition. Everything she does, she's thinking about her father and how he would have carried out his life in this particular situation, even her own family starts to resent her because of all the time and energy she's putting in to this one, this one horse. But she's thinking about her father and honoring her father and what he would have wanted. We live in a world where it's becoming more and more difficult for us to stay faithful and honor our Father in heaven. In some areas of the world, you can be put in prison or killed if you stand up to be a Christian. There's so many distractions out there. But I would argue that we can be very faithful and, and to our Father, and we can bring people to Christ by just living a life that's very humble and dedicated to serving Him. You do not need to have the gift of standing on a corner and preaching the gospel. <laughs> that's not my gift. But I think if you live a life where you're caring and humble, you will stand out to those in the world today. That woman did not care what other people thought. She wanted to honor her father and his legacy. The Lord Jesus, when he was here on this earth, many people considered him a rebel. And what he said and what he did was so different than what anyone else did. But he loved us. And he was here for one reason, and that was to bring us to his father. All he cared about is bringing glory to his Father and dealing with our sin. Jehoshaphat was a very amazing man. He was a leader and a king. And it's very easy for me to look at him and say, I could never be that man. But when you look at the way he lived his life, these are all things that each one of us can do, no matter how old or how young we are. They're very simple things that we can put in our lives every single day. Shall we pray? Oh God, our Father, we just want to say thank you for your word. And oh God, it's the living word. And it's living because we can read about it and read about people that lived many, many years ago 
And, oh God, they can change the way we live our life. Oh God, your desire is for us to live like your son, to live your, our lives like your son did. It's a very high bar. But, oh God, you give us your word, and you give us examples of how to do it. So we just pray that we'll learn from examples like King Jehoshaphat to live our lives like your son. Oh God, we know that there's a day coming when you are coming for us. And it says we'll be transformed. And oh God, our prayer for each one of us here today would be that that transformation would be very small because we'll be living so much like him that we will not need to be changed much. Oh God, please be with us as we go our separate ways now, we ask. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Amen.